Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. <sighs> Why, that she couldn't very easily get out of doors unless he knew where she was going to, said Noah. And so the first time she went out to see the lady, she, ha, 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 it made me laugh when she said it, that it did. She gave him a drink of laudanum. Hell is fire, cried Sykes, breaking fiercely from the Jew. Let me go. Flinging the old man from him, he rushed from the room and darted wildly and furiously up the stairs. Bill, Bill, cried Fagin, following him hastily. A word, only a word. The word would have not have been exchanged, but the housekeeper breaker was unable to open the door, on which she was expending fruitless oaths and violence when the Jew came panting up. Let me out, said Sykes. Don't speak to me. It's not safe. Let me out, I say. Hear me speak a word, rejoined Fagin, laying his hand upon the law. You won't be. Well, replied the other, you won't be too violent, Bill. The day was breaking, and there was light enough for the men to see each other's faces. They exchanged one brief glance. There was a fire in the eyes of both which could not be mistaken. I mean, said Fagin, showing that he felt all disguise was now useless. Not too violent for safety. Be crafty, Bill, and not too bold. Sykes made no reply, but pulling open the door of which Fagin had turned the lock, dashed into the silent streets. Without one pause or moment's consideration, without once turning his head to the right or left, or raising his eyes to the sky, or lowering them to the ground, but looked straight before him with savage resolution, his teeth so tightly compressed that the strained jaw seemed starting through his skin, the robber held on his headlong course, nor muttered a word, nor relaxed a muscle until he reached his own door. He opened it softly with the key, strode lightly up the stairs, and entering his own room, double locked the door and, lifting a heavy table against it, drew back the curtain of the bed. The girl was lying, half-dressed upon it. He had roused her from her sleep, for she raised herself with a hurried and startled look. Get up, said the man. It is you, Bill, said the girl, with an expression of pleasure at his return. It is, was the reply. Get up! There was a candle burning, but the man hastily drew it from the candlestick and hurled it under the grate. Seeing the faint light of early day without, the girl rose to undraw the curtain. Let it be, said Sykes thrusting his hand before her. There's enough light for what I've got to do. Bill, said the girl in the low voice of alarm, why do you look like, th like that at me? The robber sat regarding her for a few seconds, with dilated nostrils and heaving breast, and then, grasping her he by the head and throat, dragged her into the middle of the room and, looking once towards the door, placed his heavy hand upon her mouth. Bill, Bill, gasped the girl, wrestling with the strength of mortal fear. I won't, I won't scream or cry. Not once, hear me. Speak to me. Tell me what I have done. You know, you she-devil, returned the robber, suppressing his breath. You were watched tonight. Every word you said was heard. Then spare my life for the love of heaven as I spared yours, rejoined the girl, clinging to him. Bill. Dear Bill, you cannot have the heart to kill me. Oh, think of all I have given up only for the only this one night for you. You shall have time to think and save yourself this crime. I will not loose my hold. You cannot throw me off. Bill, Bill, for dear God's sake, for your own, for mine, stop before you spill my blood. I have been true to you. Upon my guilty soul I have. The man struggled violently to release his arms. But those of the girl were clasped round his, 
and tear her as he would. He could not tear them away. Bill, cried the girl, striving to lay her hand upon his breast. The gentleman and that dear lady told me tonight of a to, told me tonight of a home in some foreign country where I could end my days in solitude and peace. Let me see them again and beg them on my knees to show the same mercy and goodness to you. And let us both leave this dreadful place and far apart lead better lives and forget how we have lived except in prayers and never see each other more. It is never too late to repent. They told me so. I feel it now. But we must have time, a little, a little time. The housebreaker freed one arm and grasped his pistol. The certainty of immediate detection if he fired flashed across his mind even if the midst of fury and he beat it twice with all the force he could summon upon the upturned face that almost touched his. She staggered and fell, nearly blinded with the blood that rained down from a deep gash in her forehead, but raising herself with difficulty on her knees, drew from her bosom a white handkerchief, Rose Maley's own, and holding it up in her folded hands, as high towards heaven as her feeble strength would allow, breathed one prayer for mercy to her Maker. It was a ghastly figure to look upon, the murderer staggering backward to the wall and shutting out the sight with his hand. Si seized a heavy club and struck her down. Chapter 48 The Flight of Sykes of all bad deeds that, under the cover of darkness, had been committed with wide London's bounds since night hung over it, that was the worst. Of all the horrors that rose with an ill scent upon the morning, that was the foulest and most cruel air. The sun, the bright sun that brings back not light alone but new life, and hope and freshness to man, burst upon the crowded city in clear and radiant glory, through costly colored glass and paper-mended window, through cathedral dome and rotten crevice, it shed its equal ray. It lighted up the room where the murdered woman lay, it did. He tried to shut it out, but it would stream in. If the sight had been a ghastly one in the dull morning, what was it, now in all that brilliant light? He had not moved. He had been afraid to stir. There had been a moan and motion of the hand, and, with terror added to the rage, he had struck and struck again. Once he threw a rug over it, but it was worse, was worse to fancy the eyes, and imagine them moving towards him, than to see them glaring upward, as if watching the reflection of the pool of gore that quivered and danced in the sunlight on the ceiling. He had plucked it off again, and there was the body, mere flesh and blood, nor more, but such flesh, and so much blood. He struck a light, kindled a fire, and thrust the club into it. There was hair upon the end, which blazed and shrunk into a light cinder, and, caught by the air, whirled up the chimney. Even that frightened him, sturdy as he was, but he held the weapon till it broke and then piled it on in the coals to burn away and smolder into ashes. He washed himself and rubbed his clothes. There were spots that would not be removed, but he cut the pieces out and burned them. How those stains were dispersed about the room. The very feet of the dog were bloody. All this time he had, never once, turned his back upon the corpse. No, not for a moment. Such preparations completed. He moved backward towards the door, dragging the dog with him, lest he should soil his feet anew and carry out new evidence of the crime into the streets. He shut the door softly, locked it, took the key and left the house. He crossed over and glanced up at the window to be sure that nothing was visible from the outside. There was cu the curtain still drawn, which she would have opened to admit the light she never saw again. It lay nearly under there. He knew that, God, how the sun poured down upon the very spot. The glance was instantaneous. 
It was a relief to have got free of the room. He whistled on the dog and walked rapidly away. He went through Islington, strode up the hill at Highgate, on which stands the stone in honour of Whittington, turned down to Highgate Hill, unsteady of purpose and uncertain where to go, struck off to the right again, almost as soon as he began to descend it, and taking the footpath across the fields, skirted Cane Wood, and so came on Hampstead Heath. Traversing the hollow by the Vale of Heath, he mounted the opposite bank, and crossing the road which joins the villages of Hampstead and Highgate, made along the remaining portion of the heath to the fields at the north at north end in one of which he laid himself down under a ledge and slept soon he was up again and away not far into the country but back towards london by the high road then back again then over another part of the same ground as he already traversed then wandering up and down in fields and lying on ditches brings to rest and starting up to make for some spot some other spot and do the same and ramble on again. Where could he go, that was near and not too public, to get some meat and drink? Hendon? That was a good place, not far off and out of most people's way. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.